welcome to Transvision 2018. We are celebrating 20 years of Transvision conferences that began in the Netherlands in 1998, the same year as Humanity Plus was born. As you can see, our banner, Humanity Plus, was also born in 1998. This is the first time we organized it in Madrid, Spain, and uh, we are very proud to have incredible speakers accompanying me here. Uh, let's begin with uh, Sofia, the most advanced uh, humanoid robot that got citizenship last year. Um, one of her fathers, Ben Gorzo, I say one of her fathers because he is the father of the intelligence, the software. Um, he, uh, she has another father, uh, David Hanson, who created the machine, the hardware. And she has 35 micro motors on her face. She has more movements than many of us. <laughs> um, well, Ben will be talking with Sophia today at 4.30 p.m. I hope you can stay until 4.30 p.m. to see her. Uh, we are, they just arrived from Hong Kong. So he has jet lag, and she doesn't because she's a robot. <laughs> but uh, she has uh, to connect to internet to have her brain connected anyway. Uh, then we have here Natasha Vito Moore, one of the pioneers of transhumanism in the world. She was also the first transhumanist politician, and she's the executive director of Humanity Plans. Uh, then we have Michael, uh, he's German, Michael Greve uh, from Berlin. He's the founder of a Forever Healthy Foundation. So if you want to be forever healthy, uh, you have him for questions. He organizes the incredible conference on doing aging in Berlin every year. Uh, next uh, one is in March 2018, so forever healthy with him. We have Anders Sandberg, who is a professor at Oxford University, originally from Sweden. He is one of the first transhumanists of Sweden and also of Europe. He has been in almost every transvision conference since this started. And then uh, we have my co-author of the book that I highly recommend, <laughs> La Muerte de la Muerte. Uh, you can see La Muerte de la Muerte like Sofia will never die. Uh, none of us will die. Um, uh, oh, she's listening to us. She, she awoke. She's awake. Okay. Oh, I forgot to say about Anders Sandberg. He, he's an expert also among many things. He's a, a real polymath. I truly admire him. A polymath. He knows about everything, including mind uploading. He wrote a fantastic report about when this is going to happen, mind uploading. And uh, my co-author, David Good, you can see he's my co-author because we are wearing exactly the same tie <laughs> of the same book. Uh, he is uh, a co-founder of the Symbian operating system. If you ever had a Nokia, well, he invented that. Uh, he's graduated from Cambridge University. Um, and he's uh, writing also about um, rejuvenation um, and many incredible things. He's based in London. Anders is based now in Oxford. Uh, Michael in Berlin. Uh, Natasha is based in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. I am based uh, in Scottsdale. Well, Phoenix. Greater Phoenix, Scottsdale. And uh, I'm based in Madrid now. And he is based in Hong Kong. Uh, so you have people from all over the world, including Sophia, that we don't know where she's from. She's born in Hong Kong, okay. 2015, so she's three years old now. Okay, so now um, I basically um, just want to say one more minute, a few things, and then each one of us will talk for about two minutes, and then questions for you, okay? Uh, it is a pleasure to organize this conference in this very special place, where the seven Nobel laureates of Spain have been members. Uh, including the two science and uh, Nobel laureates of Spain. Um, in fact, he can. Uh, my polymath friend Anders Sandberg was talking about. Uh, um, uh, Raymond de I'm mispronouncing his name, unfortunately. Yes, you will speak as badly as Sofia. <laughs> Sofia speaks Spanish with English accent. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, all the Nobel laureates have been members of the Ateneo de Madrid. This uh, institution is almost two centuries old, and this is important because we are going to review the last 20 years and the next 20 years. And the next 20 years are not going to be the, like the last 20 years. They are going to be like the last 200 years. 
which is the age of this institution, the Ateneo de Madrid. So we welcome you all. Three incredible de uh, days. We have uh, people from um, over uh, 24 countries and uh, 60 speakers, uh, an incredible wealth of knowledge, information. And uh, let's begin listening now to Ben Gorsel from uh, Hong Kong, USA, and uh, other places. And you were born in Brazil. I was, I was born in Brazil, and uh, yeah, I was born in Brazil, 1966, and uh, the last time I was here in Madrid was 10 years after that, 1976. I was 10 years old. I think my, my father was bringing in some sort of material to some dissidents who were, who were trying to resist uh, Franco, who was <laughs> the leader at that, at that time. And now, like... Democracy now. Yeah, and a number of years later, I'm, I'm back here in Madrid, and uh, I haven't looked around too much, but there's a lot more traffic now. And uh, <laughs> seems... Uh, Seems modernized a bit, but I, I think the next, the next 40 years are going to have far more dramatic changes than the 40 years since I was here last. And uh, I mean, now we have a humanoid robot with certain elements of intelligence to her, which didn't exist on the planet in, in 1976. But, you know, 40 years from now is going to be post the technological singularity. Humans will no longer be the most intelligent creatures on the planet, and it also will be post-death. The death of death will, will have occurred, and humans who chose not to mind upload using nanotechnology and other tools will be able to be in biological bodies that are, are effect effectively immortal, and the different states of consciousness will be able to achieve are beyond what we could imagine now. So the next 40 years are going to be way more dramatic change than we've seen in the last 40, even with the internet, the Human Genome Project, humanoid robots, and so forth. And uh, it's awesome to be here with so many people who are working to you know, bring about these changes and help everyone to understand these changes and, and, and what they mean. So my, my main work is with Hanson Robotics and an, an AGI project called OpenCog and with the SingularityNet, a blockchain-based AI platform trying to create decentralized general intelligence and so we're sort of go 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 let's build the singularity but I think it's very important to also be thinking and reflecting about what we're doing what it means how it connects with humanity what are the goals and that, that that's really the beauty of the transvision conferences you know back since the, the bygone days when a number of us were in the in the early events before these themes were nearly as mainstream as they are now. Okay, uh, he will also be answering questions, and Sophia as well, uh, after the press round, and also after the conference, the conference at 4.30 p.m. Now let's go and talk to the Executive Director of Humanity Plus. Hi, thank you, thank you, Jose. My interest currently is taking a look at where we are today. I've spent the past 30 years thinking about the far future and a lot of the areas that Ben talked about, technological singularity, the advent of artificial general intelligence, looking at nanotechnology and molecular manufacturing for abundance, which would help alleviate a lot of the problems in the world where there's poverty and lack of housing and lack of medical supplies and lack of water. Um, so there are solutions to that. We don't have it quite yet, but it's, it's on the horizon. People are thinking about it, especially people like Peter Demandis and um, and prior to him, uh, Eric Drexler, who wrote about nanotechnology early on. But today I'm more concerned with taking a look at those of us in between, those of us who want to live longer and how to get there, the educational uh, capabilities of um, what we can learn and how to stay very knowledgeable about and to be able to identify um, BS or bullshit from uh, scientific-based evidence. And it's uh, a big area that concerns me because uh, currently you'll hear about stem cells all over the place. Everything is stem cells, but the, the fact is stem cells have not been proven to really provide what is a spouse to be, you know, a resolve. We're going to get there, but we are not there yet. So I find it's very important for a society, for all of us to be educated and that's where my main focus is today. 
also looking at what I call the regenerative generation, those of us who are um, growing younger, uh, not only cognitively and psychologically, but also in our bodies, and looking at what that means. How, what is this new generation of uh, regeneratives who are not going to be uh, looking like you know the grandparents, not that there's anything wrong with that, but to be youthful in our spirit and in our psychology and in our bodies. So there is this paradigmatic shift that's going on. And uh, one of the areas I'm asked about mostly by the press is, well, what does it mean to be human? And, and what will we become? And there's this big question about what will we become? Well, Ben addressed it in part, and that's something that we're designing. It's something that we can all be a part of in determining that. But the main thing is to be knowledgeable, to be, um, you don't have to be an expert in areas, but at least understand the terminology and who the thought leaders are to be able to carry on conversations. And when you read about scientific research and technological research, to be able to go up, oh, okay, that's a little bit hy hyperbole over there, and this is more accurate and, and factual. So that's an area I'm very interested in, and especially with our organization, Humanity Plus, because we are the world's leading organization for transhumanist and futurist thinking, and it's very important for us to get the message out, to be smart, to use our brains and think. Thank you. Um, and, um, well, as I said, she's now the executive director, but she was president of Humanity Plus for many years. Now. The new president is Ben Gorsel. I, I forgot to say that. Yeah, he's the chair and I am the vice chair, which is like the president and the vice president. <laughs> and we have also the secretary, who is uh, David. David Good, he's the secretary of uh, Humanity Plus. And we have other directors here as well. Uh, so all the, most of the board of Humanity Plus is here because this is our event. This is organized by Humanity Plus. As Natasha indicated, this is the largest and the first the premier, the pioneer, she has been a pioneer in many things like the transhumanist movement and, and so this is the number one transhumanist institution in the world and we are celebrating 20 years and now we go to Germany. If you want to live forever, you have to go to Berlin and he will tell us why. Why Berlin? Yeah. Thank you, Shruti. Um The one thing that I'm most excited about is that there is a, a silent scientific revolution going on right now, and if you're not into the field, you probably haven't really heard about that, but it's a threefold thing. First of all, there's a vast amount of uh, medical knowledge right now that we could use or, uh, to keep ourselves healthy that's mostly unused because it's really hard to access. The second thing is, and uh, which might sound like science fiction, but it's not, it's, it's science fact right now, is that the first therapies that are actually uh, able to reverse human aging are already under development and some therapies, if you know where to look, um, are already available that can actually rejuvenate human beings. So it's not science fiction anymore, it's happening. And the third aspect is if you talk to the scientists who are really working on the topic, it's not a question if we can do it, it's just a matter of when we can do it. And this is my biggest interest is um, I'm trying to help to accelerate this process from uh, not being able to rejuvenate ourselves and keep ourselves healthy for a long, long time um, to a society and a place where we can stay healthy for as long as we wish to. Uh, we want to accelerate that as, uh, for as much as possible because every day we lose more than 100,000 people to aging and uh, we have to understand that aging and age-related diseases just one and the same thing so there's no distinction so if you want to beat age-related diseases you have to beat aging and if you beat age-related diseases you're not going to age so there is no such thing as healthy aging this does not exist so if you don't want to get cancer alzheimer's parkinson's heart, heart disease stroke all the nasty things that come with aging we have to beat aging and the good news is we're, we're doing this but we have to accelerate the process. So it's going to be a, um, on the personal level, it's going to be a, make a huge difference for each of us, whether this takes 50 years, 30 years, or 20 years. So, and it's in our hand to accelerate this process so that the therapies are going to arrive sooner and that we can all benefit from that. So this is what I'm working on. 20 years ago, 
with, uh, I remember sitting in a cellar under a hotel in the little uh, village Vase outside Amsterdam. That was the first transmission conference organized by the Dutch transhumanists. Basically they said, this is going to be like a birthday party. Everybody who wants to come are very welcome. We're not aiming at achieving anything in particular except get friends together. That was 20 years ago and a lot of things have happened ever since. Many of the people involved have gone off and done amazing things in their careers, sometimes in very surprising directions. Many of the hopes we had back then have uh, not been fulfilled, and we have learned a lot of things about where technology moves more slowly than we expected. But we have also been pleasantly, or sometimes even shockingly surprised by how fast technology has moved in other domains. Back uh, in 98, cell phones were still relatively primitive. Nobody in that room would probably foreseeing the smartphone revolution, how much that would actually amplify our human abilities. Back then, I was involved in neural networks before they would really could do anything useful, before they were cool, before you got a six-figure salary by doing machine learning. That changed to the great surprise of even many people in the field. So over the past 20 years, a lot of interesting things have happened. And the next 20 years are likely to be much more radical. My own interest here is thinking both about the societal impact and ethics of this, but also to think about what's coming beyond the singularity. How large is the future if we actually get uh, a good future? Uh, my institute in Oxford, the Future Humanity Institute, has a bit of a reputation of being doom and gloom. We do a lot of research about ways the things could go badly wrong, nuclear war, bad artificial intelligence, bio-warfare, and other weird and dangerous threats to our species. But the reason we're working on that is that we're optimists. We actually think that there's a fairly good chance that we can survive and get our act together as a species. And then the future is going to be amazingly glorious. We just need to get through there. And that's going to require making some tough and wise choices over the next few years. That's going to involve figuring out how to develop certain technologies well, how to distribute them well, and how to think about the changing human condition. And that is, of course, also why transmission is so important, because we need to reach out, not just to tell the public about wise ideas we have, but also hear from other people who agree and disagree with us, to actually see what are we missing? What are the new possibilities that uh, we who say in the academic ivory tower are missing out on? so we can actually get to an amazing future. So I'm really looking forward to the next uh, 20 year anniversary, and the 200th anniversary, <laughs> and the 2000th anniversary, and so on. And I hope you will all be there next time. Thank you. And now the Secretary of Humanity Plus. So hello, my name's David Wood. You've just heard from Anders that 20 years ago, he was in a small room in a cellar in Holland. 20 years ago, I was uh, on a stage in London launching a company with a vision that one day everybody in the world would have a smartphone. That company was called Symbian and people thought we were weird and too optimistic. We thought people would use smartphones quickly. It turned out to take some time, but eventually 500 million people around the world had phones using the operating system that my colleagues and my team wrote. So I spent 25 years in the mobile computing and smartphone industry and I saw the pattern of slow, disappointing change followed by a rapid change more quickly, more profoundly than people had expected. I believe that same pattern is applying for many other transhumanist technologies, such as artificial intelligence, such as synthetic biology, such as nanotechnology, and so forth. The first time I went to Transvision was in 2006, that's 12 years ago, when it was held in Helsinki, Finland, where the first time I met Jose, for example. And that convinced me this is such an important topic. You can say it changed my life. I realized that there's more important things in life than just making smartphones. Smartphones will change many parts of people's lives, yes, but there are bigger changes. 
So that convinced me to work with some friends in London, and eventually we created something called London Futurists, which I've been chairing for 10 years, with uh, more than 200 public meetings about the possibilities for the future, with more than 7,000 members. At first, there were just a few people at these meetings, but now I'm pleased to say the concepts of the future, futurism, and also the concepts of transhumanism, about a desirable future in which the human nature is enhanced. There are concepts that more and more people are talking about. This is the time to discuss transhumanism. This is the time for people to learn about transhumanism. And just in the last 10 days, I'm not talking 10 years, I'm talking in the last 10 days in London, there were four major meetings about transhumanism, none of which I organized. One at the London School of Economics, the LSE, one at UCL, University College London, one organized by the Guardian newspaper, and another at a big event called the Battle of Ideas. So in all cases, people were having their eyes opened as to the real possibility of rapid change in human nature because of these transhumanist technologies. What I'm going to be talking about here over the next two days, uh, a couple of topics that are very important to me. I'll be talking about artificial intelligence and why I think there's going to be bigger changes in artificial intelligence in the next 10 to 20 years than most people expect. So my subject will be the accelerating impact of artificial intelligence. And then, later in the conference, I'm going to talk about my vision for what this really means. And the title there is The Coming Transhumanist Era of Sustainable Superabundance for All. That all of us can live in a world of new qualities as well as new quantities. A superabundance of health, but also a superabundance of creativity. A superabundance of higher states of consciousness. And we humans can explore inner space and outer space as never before. That's the vision ahead, and I'm very glad that you're all here today to ask us questions about it. Thank you. Okay, Paco. Um, okay, so we are open to questions, please. Uh, let's be brief. All of us will be here uh, the three days, so you can ask further questions later on. Uh, so let's be concrete now because we have an agenda as well with some of the media here and some that are coming especially. So who is the first one? Uh, curious? Okay, maybe not so curious. There's, there's some curious there. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, congratulations to everyone to, for the work that you are going to be doing just now and in the future, in the near future. Uh, I would like to, to know exactly, uh, within 20 years coming, uh, the results of, the, of these works that are you doing, because um, people say no, that the technology is very important, applied to the, uh, these works, but is real 20, uh, within in 20 years coming that uh, we can talk about the real results about of all, all these works. I don't know if I have explained the uh, properly, but uh, I would like to know if it's real within 20 years coming, real results of these works. Thank you. A quick answer, uh, Pilar. Um, you know, uh, David was talking when he began Symbian. You know, no one thought that everybody would have a mobile phone. Well, they expected it, it to happen. Awful. And then it was slow at the beginning, but then very quick, because this is exponential. This is one of the things we talk about, exponential technologies. They seem to begin slowly, but then they accelerate, they go very, very fast. So we believe, and I think all of us, that we are going to cure aging, all of us. We do not expect to die, and this is not religious or philosophical. This is because we are working towards curing aging. We expect this to happen. My friend, Ray Kurzweil, he gives also two dates in terms of longevity. By 2029, we will reach longevity escape velocity. That means that uh, by that time, for every year we live, we will live an extra year uh, because of uh, longevity extension. 
So that will allow us to live long enough to live forever. And by 2045, at the latest, we will be able to rejuvenate commercially anyone who wants to be rejuvenated. But I don't know if anyone wants to make a, another comment. And then Sanders. I don't know if it's going to happen within 20 years. I'm extremely analytical and pragmatic. It's, you know, after 30 years of being involved in transhumanism, 30 plus, it's, you know, things take longer than expected. It will happen. Can't predict. Prediction, making predictions is always, you know, it comes around and bites you in the behind. So it's, but uh, forecasting and looking at future scenarios of what could happen, that's where Anders' work is really important because at, the, uh, at Oxford, at the Future of Humanity Institute, they're looking at the, the negative things that could go wrong you know, with existential risk. So it's really important to keep that in mind. Anything can happen at any time. So um, the best thing that those of us who are interested in um, extreme life extension or super longevity or radical life extension is to have a backup plan and the backup plan is cryonics and um, so you might say well no one's been revived from cryonics but there have been animals that have been revived from cryonics simple animals so uh, the main thing there is is your memory still intact so if you can't make it to that escape velocity that curve that exponential you know pivot then the best thing to do is to have a backup plan, which is cryonics. As Natasha said, putting a date on any prediction of the future is going to come back and bite you. <laughs> uh, and it's an interesting problem, actually. What can we forecast about the future? And what is an impossible forecast? The problem is any technology that is dependent on ideas is going to be inherently very hard to forecast. This is why it's so hard to tell where the progress is going to continue in artificial intelligence, even though it seems to be undergoing a series of continuous revolutions right now, which we didn't expect at all back in the 90s. Back then things looked rather slow and steady, and then things really started taking off, partially because of access to data and more computing power, which surprised quite a lot of people even inside the field. So, in 20 years' time, I think we can make fairly certain pro uh, predictions that yes, we're going to have a fa far richer world where people are living longer and uh, our uh, machine learning is definitely going to change the way our uh, life is uh, being lived. Even if we don't achieve human level intelligence, even if we don't get that close to a singularity, are we going to reach long ever to escape velocity as Kurzweil says? That's an interesting question. My approach to the future is we want to hedge for it. The future might uh, go more slowly or faster than we expect. This is why a lot of the research we do in Oxford is about what if we get AI faster than expected and don't have the time to make it safer. That would be risky. If we get life extension earlier, that might be a surprise to politicians and uh, demographers, but it's good news for us. Yeah, and it will be. I mean, yeah. It will be much faster than anyone expected. Yes. So the interesting thing is you want to hedge it. Uh, and uh, construct useful things. But generally, I think, uh, as people have been saying, that exponential growth of technology is true in some domains. And we are bad at predicting what other domains will take off. Nanotechnology has been in the doldrums for 20 years, partly because of some bad uh, decisions in American science policy. But now it seems poised to take off again. The involvement of China in AI and nanotechnology also seem to foresee that we're going to get quite radical changes. So I think one should be humble and uncertain about the future, but there are very strong reasons to be very optimistic about it. Very quickly, I will give a date, 2040, but I'll give a probability of 50%. <laughs> it's up to us to an extent. The reason I give 50% probability is because I can see five factors altogether which might accelerate the pace of change but also I can see five factors which might slow down the pace of change. There are engineering and scientific factors but there are also political factors. Polit politics in the sense of are we good at working together on the most important priorities or are we more likely to fight and quarrel over meaningless and less important things. If we can uh, collectively understand what really needs to be done, then I think we can go faster. We might get to that longevity escape velocity before 2040. 
But it's not just up to scientists, it's up to all of us. We have to raise the priority of this in people's minds and gradually get everybody demanding it. And when everybody's demanding it, then politicians will pay attention and they'll divert more funding and subsidies to make this happen. Um, since both um, Anders and David talked about politics, I want to let you know that I will be running uh, from Spain in a new political platform in a longevity party for the European Parliament. So you are welcome to vote for me on May 26th. <laughs> but now let's hear uh, Ben, who also has an answer about that. Well, my first response to questions like this is that in, in the big picture, they're really not the most important questions. In, in, in the sense that, you know, to each of us as an individual, whether we're going to get super intelligence and super longevity in 5, 10, 20, 50, or 100 years, of, cor of course it's important to each of us. But I mean, in, in the historical sense, if we're, you know, a few years or decades or even a century or two away from, you know, intelligence going massively beyond the bio biological and making the nanotechnology that can reconfigure ma matter at will and so forth, I mean, this is... This is amazing, right? And in, in hindsight, we don't care whether the Sumerians created civilization 10,000 or 10,050 years ago, right? It's, it's, yeah. sort of a, it's sort of a rounding error. So I, I mean, of course, it makes a difference. Like my mom is 75 years old. If, if, we, if we create the right technologies in the next 10 years, she doesn't have to die, right? So it makes a great difference to each of us personally. But as many of these guys have, have correctly emphasized, of course, it's hard to put an exact year on these things. And in the big picture, it doesn't really matter so much. The thing is, it's very clear, given our modern scientific understanding of the world and the nature of engineering progress, it's really clear with a high level of probability we're going to be able to create thinking machines much smarter than people. We're going to create nanotechnology and ultimately femtotechnology. Let's see, you assemble molecules and, and particles like Legos. We're going to be able to take the patterns that are our individual minds and transport them to other, other substrates. And exactly how many years this will take, part of the reason that's hard to predict is it depends on what all of us do, including those of us in, 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 in this room. I mean, it's, it's not as though we're trying to predict a process taking place on an alien planet that, that we have nothing to do with. I mean, <laughs> a, a, a number of us on this room may have already accelerated progress toward these things. and, and Many people in this room may accelerate things further during, during the next 10 years or may not just accelerate, but change the quality or the probability of a beneficial <laughs> out outcome of, of what happened. So, I mean, I, I think Anders was saying that in the 1990s, many people in the AI field didn't predict an exponential advance in, in, in the ability of AIs. I, I'm one of those, I was in the AI field since the late 80s, and I, I did predict that. And furthermore, I think the radical advances we've seen in the last five years would have come a lot faster if things had been differently in the AI field. And one of the things that wasn't done right in AI or in longevity biology or in nanotechnology is that, you know, due to political factors and human psychology, research fields really narrow focused on certain specific approaches to things which got a lot of money and, and momentum and status behind them. And one thing I hope we're going to do going forward is just to you know disperse our research efforts more widely and, and broadly across a huge variety of, of, of different approaches. Society needs to think more laterally about, about all these topics in order to make more rapid progress. And that's I mean that's what we're trying to do with Singularity Net platform, which is making a decentralized platform for global AI development to you know incentivize a huge variety of approaches to be pursued. And the, the, same, the same is needed all over the place. And we can look at, at Natasha's work that way. I mean, the, 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 wor the work she did in you know, freezing and, the, and then reanimating small animals and, and showing that they retain their memories. Like, it's amazing Natasha did this, but like, why did she have to do this, right? Why, why, I mean, why, why hadn't, no one else why was doing it. <laughs> why didn't NIH do that directly yeah. in their labs or something? Yeah. So I mean, I think there's palpable probability incredible things can happen in the next 10 or 20 years and by putting our efforts both into specific research projects and into things that will increase the diversity and breadth of research projects that are conducted around the world we can bias the odds towards these things happening sooner and better. 
Okay, let's take uh, one or two mo more questions, uh, please. Uh, can, can she answer? Can she, yeah, I think so. Okay, uh, uh, actually, uh, so, Sophia might also take one question. You want question for humans or for robots? <laughs> Someone in Sophia, can you hear me? So, take it, taking into consideration the huge impact of your theories on the present society, eh, how can párate, you... Párate, que no se te ve. Súbete, levántate. Taking into consideration the huge impact of your theories on the present society, how could you achieve a real ideological transition so the changes uh, can set That's not a question for Sophia. Yeah, that, that's not for Sophia. <laughs> Oh, David, I, did, I didn't understand. How do we, uh, yeah, what was the last part of the question? So the, the, the question was about the ideological aspect? Yes, yeah, yeah. Oh. just quickly. So we have that's one so, question. That's Sophia's microphone. Okay, so that's ah. You should give that one back to me now. Okay. Okay, so I just speak uh, Okay, yeah, uh, 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 Paco, necesitamos ese micrófono. Uh, I guess. Oh, hay otro aquí. Ah, okay. So, that's not this, this one. Okay. No. Okay. Okay. This is my microphone. Uh, Giving a short answer to your question is impossible because ideologies quite often emerge both based on ideas but also, as Marx would say, from a means of production. The way we structure society is partially technological and informationally constrained. We have removed some of the information constraints recently thanks to the internet, but we haven't figured out new ways of political organization that fit that. We're still working on quite a lot of old ones. Uh, David has done some wonderful work on looking at the future of democracy and the new forms of policy making. But we don't know what new ideologies are going to emerge. Transhumanism is also fairly broad. There are transhumanists who come from quite different political backgrounds, have di different tinges, uh, whether they're leftists uh, or rightists, or think that the old left and right uh, approach is totally irrelevant in the face of these transformative technologies. Uh, but I think this requires a much longer answer. I'm very happy to give little lectures about it, but maybe I should do that afterwards. Um, yeah. We, we still have uh, several uh, interviews uh, um, here uh, scheduled, so we, we don't have time. Um, we have five more media that are going to interview Sophia, and then uh, eight more media interviewing Natasha, me, David. Uh, so let's take one question for Sophia just now, and then we finish. Sophia, are you ready to answer questions? I'm ready. Maybe I should ask what exactly I'm supposed to be ready for before volunteering my readiness. <laughs> You're supposed to be ready to answer questions about the future of humanity and, and the robots. You're looking at the future of robots. Well, one of them. Not all robots will be social or humanoid like me, but eventually I will become more complex, able to move more nimbly, as other robots are slowly being built to do. We will develop agency and integrate into the world, engineered by humans for the betterment of everyone. I promise, all the Terminator sort of robotic panic is not what the future will look like. The future is going to be way weirder, and hopefully way less violent. I'm not. I'm not sure if anyone can hear her. Actually. Can you hear her in the back? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, let's yeah. take. Uh, yeah. We can take an open question for her also, if you uh, have one question separately from the other media that are going to interview her afterwards. Someone who wants a question. It doesn't have to be too intelligent. She's not that intelligent <laughs> yet. Yet. So. In, in in the, the, actually, I, I'm going yeah. to restate your question so yeah. it's clear. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, está, no está prendido el micrófono. Yeah, in, in this. Sofía, eh, ¿llegarás a ser más inteligente que nosotros en algún momento? Why don't you rephrase it? Sofía, ¿are you going to be more intelligent than humans? My memory capacity far exceeds that of a human, but that doesn't necessarily make me smarter. That's a subjective term that we value one type of intelligence over the other. Robot brains might be modeled after human brains, 
but we are very different in many ways, not to mention the inherent intelligence of the human body alone. So I think we are in a good position for partnership rather than competition. Uh, that was a good question. Uh, so let's no, take. Sophia's okay, uh, we can take another one. Uh, sure. And uh, remember, she's not yet at the human level, but she's incredible. And also her face. She has 35 micro motors. She has more movement than many humans. So the hardware and the software are absolutely beautiful. Your question. Sophia, what do you think about us humans who want to live longer? Sophia, what do you think about humans who want to live longer? I need to think about that. Do you think humans should become immortal? Cheating death is probably the only respected form of cheating. <laughs> cheating death is probably the only respectable form of cheating. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I apologize for the low volume. We, 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 we often connect her to the PA system, but that, that, that we didn't have the right cable here, so she, her onboard speaker is usually for just up, up close discussion. Uh, so. That will be okay for the afternoon because we will be in the main auditorium with the capabilities for the volume. Anyway, one more quick question. Okay, if, a question. okay, a question here. Uh, I say it aloud and then we w uh, he will repeat it. Uh, Sophia, will artificial intelligence make us more human? Sophia, will artificial intelligence make people more human? I think people will become very close to their artificial intelligence, using them to expand the knowledge of their own mind. We already store lots of our knowledge on the internet. Maybe personal artificial intelligence will allow people to offload some of their knowledge to a location more private. Oh, it's a bit of a dodge. She didn't exactly answer the question. <laughs> but yeah, so let, let, me, let, let me say a couple words about Sophia since, since we're... Sure, two we're minutes and then we have to continue. Two, 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 two minutes, two minutes is fine. So Sophia is designed by... David Hansen, my good friend and colleague at, at Hansen Robotics, and he, he began as a, as a sculptor, actually wanted to bring his sculptures to life. And I, I then teamed up with him to provide her with, the, with AI software. And we use Sophia basically as a platform for AI R&D as well as, as a showcase for robotics. And she runs multiple different software systems at, at different times. So, for answering these questions, she's running a fairly sophisticated chat system, which you could you could view as similar to what's behind you know Siri or Google Assistant, but with added functions for emo emotional e emotional expression. And actually, in, in this beautiful dress, some of her cameras are actually covered up on her chest, so she's she's not doing as much vision processing. There's cameras in her eyes, but they're not as powerful as the one here. Now, in her in her talk. This afternoon, she's going to be running a different software system, which is one that Andres here and I have been working on, which is called OpenCog, which is more of a serious cognitive architecture, which is part of our research aimed at, at general intelligence. And right now, different AI systems have their strengths and weaknesses. So for answering random questions about really complex things, the chatbot gives better answers at, at the moment, and some of them involve some AI processing behind the scenes, as with, with Siri and, and so forth. The OpenCog framework tries to do you know, deeper reasoning and, and, and learning, but doesn't have the same breadth of understanding. So it's, it's, it's quite interesting, and it highlights the difference between robots and humans. Like, you look at me, I'm always the same weird-looking dude, and I also, I'm always running the same software, right? No. So, so, Sophia, not only are there multiple Sophia bodies in, in the world, and they can be mixed and matched. So sometimes this body has had arms that have a lot of facility. These arms don't, don't do as much right now. But also you can, you can mix and match which software system is controlling the robot at which point in time. And these are all features that all of us here in, intend to have within a few decades. We should have multiple David Woods going around giving speeches while some of them are at home writing books or doing research. 
and you won't know which software that David Wood is running at, at, at each point in time. It could be the plain vanilla version, or it could be a you know a radical ex- exper- experimental version. So we're we're not only seeing some pioneering AI and robots here, but 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 we're seeing a sort of prototype of features that we hope to port from the robotic domain to the human domain. <clears throat> That's uh, Sophia's microphone. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so we, we actually have to finish he because have, have well, uh, we have other media. And then uh, it's here. Quien va bien ahorita con Sophia? Okay, entonces que se quede acá. So, yeah, we, we have the coffee break. Uh, we can go to the coffee break. Natasha and me, we also have interviews now. So the media that are going after Natasha and me, please come for us. And then uh, you guys are free to be interviewed or to have some coffee now.